Hello, today we're continuing with our series of GCSE Physics Revision and we're going to be looking at projectile motion which is a subject in some of the syllabuses of GCSE Physics. Projectile motion is what you get if you, for example, throw a ball or even fire a gun in somewhere where gravity is, uh, is operating. For example, suppose I throw a ball vertically up in the air. It will go up in the air, but under the influence of gravity, it will slow down until eventually it stops and then it just comes straight back down again to the ground. So it starts with an initial velocity, but gravity is slowing it down until it stops and then it comes back down again. Or we could actually throw the ball at an angle. Let's say we throw it at an angle alpha. If there were no gravity, of course, it would just, according to Newton's first law, continue in a straight line. But because of gravity, what it actually does is to make a curve before it re-hits the ground again. And that curve is called a parabola. The maximum height is in the middle and the total distance that the object travels before it hits the ground is called the range. There's a further thing I can do, of course, I can kick a ball horizontally off the top of a cliff. So if this is the cliff and I kick a ball horizontally onto the, let's say, the beach below, what will happen is that if there were no gravity, of course, it would just carry on like that. But because of gravity, once more, it will describe a curve called a parabola and land on the beach below. And the range is the distance from the bottom of the cliff to the point at which the object lands. All of that is projectile motion. If we take the case of projectile motion where we throw the ball at an angle so that it goes something like this, then the maximum range, that is the furthest that it travels, will arise at an angle of 45 degrees for any given velocity. Obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but the fact is that the faster you throw it, the further it will go. But if you throw it at a constant velocity, let's say 20 meters per second, then you need to throw it at an angle of 45 degrees to get the maximum range. If you throw it at velocity v at a larger angle, then it will go higher, but not so far. If you throw it at a uh, lower or smaller angle, then it will come back to Earth much more quickly and you won't get a maximum range. The maximum range is when the angle is 45 degrees. Now you can what is called resolve the initial velocity. Let's say we set off with an initial velocity v at an angle alpha. We know that the actual trajectory will be a parabola, but the initial velocity is at an angle alpha. And what you can do is to resolve that velocity into a horizontal component called V horizontal and a vertical component called V vertical. Now, if you know your sines and your cosines, then you ought to know that since this is V vertical, then since this is a rectangle, this too will be V vertical. Then the opposite over the hypotenuse is equal to the sine of the angle. So the opposite over the hypotenuse is sine alpha. And that means that the vertical component of the velocity is equal to V sine alpha. So if you know what V is and you know what alpha is, you can work out what the vertical component of the velocity is. Similarly, you should know that the adjacent over the hypotenuse is the cosine of the angle. So the adjacent over the hypotenuse is the cosine of the angle, which means that the horizontal component of the velocity is V cosine alpha. So if you know the velocity that you throw the ball and the angle at which you throw it, 
you can work out what the vertical component and the horizontal component of those velocities are simply by sines and cosines. If you don't know about cosines and sines, you're not stuck. What you can do is to draw a scale diagram. And what you do is you draw a line to a scale that represents what you want to achieve. So you would draw the line at the angle alpha and you might draw it such that every centimeter represents a meter per second. So for example, if the ball is traveling at five meters per second, you draw a line that was five centimeters long. And then you bring down the ver uh, uh, a perpendicular here and the length of this side gives you the vertical component and the length of this side gives you the horizontal component. In other words, the number of centimeters of this side would be the number of meters per second to that scale. And that would represent the vertical component of the velocity. And the number of centimeters in length of this line would give you the number of meters per second of the horizontal component of the velocity. So you can do it two ways, depending on whether or not you understand about sines and cosines. How does that help? Well, it helps because you can regard the vertical and the horizontal components of the velocity as acting completely independently. You can consider first the vertical action and velocity, and then you can separately consider the horizontal action. And remember that we're talking about here about projectiles that are moving in the presence of gravity. Gravity acts downwards. It does not act sideways. So gravity as a vertical force only has an impact on the vertical component of the velocity. It has no effect on the horizontal component of the velocity, as we shall see in some examples I'll do in a moment. So let's do some examples for which we will need the SUVAT equations that we derived in the very first video, and I'll remind you of what they are as we go along. We'll start off by thinking about the projectile that goes vertically upwards. So as we said, you throw it exactly vertically upwards, it will be going up um, against the gravitational pull, which is pulling down, so it will be slowing all the time. When it gets to its highest point, it comes to a halt, and it just falls straight back down to Earth again. Let's suppose that the initial velocity that we throw the ball up at, initial velocity is u, we're going to call that 20 meters per second upwards. Gravity, we're going to regard as, which is also of course the acceleration, we're going to regard that as 10 meters per second squared. It's usually 9.81 but 10 is easier to work with. It will tell you in an exam which one to use. And we have to be careful here about vectors because vectors have direction. Remember, the velocity is traveling up, but gravity is pulling down. So we're going to need to reflect that. And the way we do that is we say, you can choose any convention you like, as long as you're consistent. The convention I'm going to choose is that the upwards direction is going to get a positive value and the downwards direction is going to get a negative value. So if something is moving or accelerating up, that's positive. If something is moving or accelerating down, that's negative in this particular case. And the exam question here is we want to know two things. We want to know how long does it take? In other words, what is the time for it to get from the lowest point to the top where it stops? And the second thing we want to know is how far does it travel as it goes up? So how high does it go? The point, of course, to remember is that when it gets to the top, it's effectively stopped because it stopped moving up and it will now start moving down. So at that point at the top, the final velocity is zero. So if we want to find the time first, we know V, sorry, we know U, we know V, we know the acceleration, which is G, we need to know the time. What is the SUVAT equation that links those four things? It is that V equals U plus A T. That was the second SUVAT equation. And now all we do is to plug the values in. V we know is zero. So zero equals U is 20. 
Now, it's plus a, but a is going in the negative direction, so it's going to be minus 10, because g is going in the opposite direction to u, so u is positive, but g is, is negative, times t, which we don't know. And that means that 10t equals 20, t equals 2 seconds. So it takes 2 seconds for the ball to go from the bottom to the point where it stops at its highest point. And incidentally, it will also take a further 2 seconds to come back down to where it started from. Now we want to know the uh, distance. Well, we could use one of two SUVAT equations for this. I shall use the fourth v squared equals u squared plus 2as, where s is the distance. Once again, I know that v, that the velocity at the top is zero. So zero, zero squared is zero. Equals u squared, well u is 20, so 20 squared is 400. Plus 2 times a, well remember a is going in the opposite direction, the negative direction, so that's a minus 10, so that's 2 times minus 10 times the distance s, which is what we don't know. So naught is equal to 400 plus 2 times minus 10 is minus 20 times s is minus 20s. And that means that 20s equals 400. So s is equal to 400 divided by 20, which is 20 meters. So the ball travels 20 meters until it gets to its highest point, And it takes two seconds to do so. Now I want to think of the example of the cliff which drops down to the beach below. And what I'm going to do is simply drop a ball. I'm not going to throw it. I'm simply going to hold it out, let go, and it falls. Obviously, it will fall down to the beach below. And I can tell you that the cliff is 40 meters high. Obviously, the initial velocity, u, is going to equal zero because I don't throw it, I just drop it. So I let go. It starts with an initial velocity uh, of zero. g, which equals a, equals 10 meters per second squared. And the two things I want to know now are what is the velocity with which the ball hits the ground and how long does it take to do so? Well, on this particular occasion, you'll notice that everything is in the same direction. The velocity is downwards, gravity is downwards, everything is downwards. We don't have to worry about signs, so we'll just use the SUVAT equations um, as they come. We know s, which is 40 meters, that's how far the ball is going to drop. We know the initial velocity u, and we know a. We want to find t, let's say. Let's say we do t first. Well, that's the, the third SUVAT equation, s equals ut plus a half at squared. So s, we know the distance the ball falls is 40 meters, so that's 40, is equal to u times t. Well, u is zero, because we drop the ball, we don't throw it. So ut is zero, plus a half times a, which is 10, times t, which we don't yet know, squared. So 40 equals Forget the zero, half of 10 is five, so that's five t squared, and that means that t squared is 40 divided by five, which is eight. So now we need the square root of, of eight to find t, and the square root of eight is 2.83 seconds. So it takes 2.83 seconds for the ball once dropped not thrown, dropped, to hit the beach below. We now need to know what its velocity is when it hits the beach below. Well, we can now use uh, any equation you want to use. Let's use v equals u plus at. v is what we want to know. u we know is zero because we dropped the ball. So v is zero, plus the acceleration is g, which is 10, and the time we just calculated was 
2.83 seconds. It takes 2.83 seconds to hit the deck. So consequently, the velocity is going to be 10 times 2.83, which is 28.3 meters per second. And of course, velocities have to have direction. And so the direction is downwards. In other words, the velocity will be going down when it hits the beach. Now let's take exactly the same cliff example, the cliff with the beach. And this time I'm standing on the top of the cliff and I'm going to kick the ball horizontally at six meters per second. If there were no gravity, as we have said before, the ball would just continue to travel horizontally without falling. It's gravity that will make it fall and so it will curve something like that. If the ball were not being kicked at six meters per second, if it was simply dropped, then as you know from the previous example we did, it would just fall like that. If we kick it faster than six meters per second, say eight meters per second, then you won't be surprised to know the ball will actually travel further because we give it a, a, a higher velocity. What may surprise you is that it doesn't matter whether you drop it or whether you kick it at six meters per second or you kick it at eight meters per second, the time for the ball to hit the beach is exactly the same in each case. Because in each case, only the vertical velocity counts and the initial vertical velocity in each case is zero. Because the initial velocity is six meters per second, but that's horizontal. I quite specifically said I kick the ball horizontally. There is no component which is vertical. So in all these cases, the actual vertical component of the velocity is zero. And so it will take the same amount of time for the ball to fall over the height of the cliff, which in this case I can tell you is 45 meters. Whether you drop it or whether you kick it slowly or whether you kick it quickly, if you kick it in a horizontal direction, the times will always be the same. So let's look, and what I want to know in this particular question is how long does it take for the ball to hit the deck? Sorry, it shouldn't be T squared, that's just T. And the second question is, what is the range? How far from the cliff edge does it fall? Now the distance from the cliff edge will be determined by the horizontal velocity, but the time to fall will not. Let's work out the uh, time to fall. We know that G, which is A, is 10 meters per second squared. Sorry, 10 meters per second squared. Um, and so we'll use the third SUVAT equation, which is S is UT plus a half AT squared. Everything you'll notice is again moving in the downwards direction, so we don't need to worry about signs now. All velocities, um, at least the vertical velocities are moving down. Um, it's when we come to the horizontal velocities we'll have to think about it. So here we've got that the ball is going to fall a distance of 45 meters in the vertical direction. We're not interested in the length of this curve, that doesn't matter. We're thinking about velocity in the vertical direction separately from the velocity in the horizontal direction. I said you could regard each of them entirely independently. We're looking at the vertical position and we're going to ask how long does it take to fall that vertical distance. So the distance you travel is 45 meters and that equals UT. Well, once again, the horizontal velocity may be six meters a second, but the, but the vertical velocity is zero. There is no component of velocity in the vertical direction. So UT is zero plus a half times A, which is 10 times T squared, which we don't know. So 45 is equal to half of 10 is 5t squared. So t squared is equal to 45 over 5, which equals 9. So t is equal to 3 seconds. So it's going to take 3 seconds for that ball to hit the deck. Notice that nowhere in that equation do we feature the horizontal velocity of six meters per second? It isn't needed. That's why it doesn't matter what the horizontal velocity is, or indeed if there is no horizontal velocity, if you simply drop the ball over the side, 
the time taken for each of these trajectories is going to be the same, and that's three seconds. Now let's ask the question, how far does it travel this way? Well, now we're talking about the horizontal direction. So we'll once again use, don't forget when we did this, it was for the vertical direction. Now we're gonna consider the same formula, but this time in the horizontal direction. S equals ut plus a half at squared. S is now what we want to know. S is the range. How far does it travel in the horizontal direction before it hits the beach? Well, that's going to equal u, which I told you was six meters a second, times t, which we just calculated is three seconds. It takes three seconds before it hits the beach and then it's not going to travel any further. So six times three plus a half at squared. There is no acceleration in the horizontal direction. Gravity doesn't pull anything to the side, it only pulls down. So since gravity is equal to zero and there's no other acceleration, this whole term equals zero. So S is simply going to be six times three, which is 18 meters. Now you'll notice that the distance S will be affected by the horizontal velocity. If that were seven instead of six, then the distance would have been seven times three, 21 meters. And if the, initial, if the horizontal velocity had been five meters per second, the distance would be five times three, 15 meters. So yes, the horizontal velocity with which you kick the ball will determine how far from the cliff the ball actually lands, but the time that it takes to fall is entirely the time it takes to fall through the vertical distance, and that's handled entirely separately from the horizontal distance.